hearing anything really quickly or seeing any hands go up, again, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dwight Chaucer. He is a retired industrial organic chemist. He received his PhD in chemistry from Case Western Reserve University, but he has also been a birder for about 35 years. He has enjoyed many aspects of field ornithology, including chemistry related to birds, finding nests of out of place birds, leading bird walks for the public, surveying bird populations, traveling to other countries to see birds and participating in bird oriented organizations, some of which he has also been the president of. And Dwight was also a member of the Ohio Bird Records Committee for four years, and he is now an eBird reviewer for three counties in Ohio. Somehow amongst all of this, um, he is turning some of his interests into publications and presentations, which we now get to be the happy recipients of. So Dwight, I will turn it over to you and turn my video off. So thank you so much for joining us tonight. Okay, thank you, uh, Katie, for the kind introduction. Um, I have a confession to make right away. Uh, I've, while I've talked to many, many audiences in person, I've only ever done a, a uh, Zoom presentation maybe twice uh, and, and not, not this particular one. So you'll have to bear with me. So I have another confession to make. Uh, I'm a bird watcher. I bird almost every day. I travel to see birds in other countries, as Katie said. I read about birds a lot. I do bird surveys for the national park here and for other groups. And uh, I like to end up talking about birds as well. Now, before we get into the program in itself, uh, I'd like to give you some statistics on bird watching. Uh, it's considered the second fastest growing outdoor activity in North America. Uh, that could change, uh, maybe it's, uh, it was first for a while, uh, recently with photography, photography might be a little fast, uh, faster growing. It's been said that 45 to 70 million people in North America watch birds. And when you think about it, um, uh, people say, well, what are, uh, out of those 45 to 75 million people who watch birds, you would think that some of them could be famous people. Uh, the says six million people uh, in that 45 to 70 million people some of those people are probably people who look out the window and see a robin and say that's the robin and therefore i'm a bird watcher uh, so the number might be less than that uh, six million people in north america can id 30 species of birds that's been stated elsewhere and when you think about that if you say canada goose bald eagle robin cardinal, uh, it adds a mallard, it adds up pretty fast, fast. so maybe six million people can identify greater than 30 species of birds. But for dedicated bird watchers, one million, it's been said that one million people in North America are dedicated bird watchers. I'm a scientist, so I, I give myself a little bit of wiggle room here, saying it's plus or half a million uh, up or down. That, that, that are people who watch uh, or are dedicated bird watchers. So you'd think with that many people watching birds, some of these people would be famous for, for could be people who are famous for other reasons, but have an inter a strong interest in bird watching. Uh oh, I can't get that to change. Uh, Okay, sorry about that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about bird diver diversity first. Uh, there's nearly 10,000 species of birds in the world. Uh, over a thousand of those have been documented in North America. And in any one year, a person who was serious could, could find uh, at least 700 uh, of those species in North America. In Ohio, we have uh, documented 430 species of birds. In Louisiana, you've documented 480 species of birds uh, over, over history. Uh, here in, the, uh, in Ohio, in my uh, backyard, essentially, 
we have a Cuyahoga Valley National Park is a 33,000 acre park and we've, we've documented 245 species of birds. Uh, in terms of nesting species in North America, there are about 650 uh, species that nest in, and we, we've documented about 100 to 105 species have nested in the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. But in, in essence, 80% uh, of, of the birds in North America migrate to some extent. Uh, they can migrate from uh, higher altitude to lower altitude from, uh, from west to east, but in but the majority of the migration, 25% migrate south of the border, and these are called neotropical migrants. Now, back in 2011, a, a movie was released called The Big Ear, and for those of you who don't know what The Big Ear is, it's when a person decides to find as many birds as he, as he or she possibly can, uh, in a particular area like North America, the ABA area in North America, uh, between January 1st and the end of December. And, and, and this happened in, uh, in 1998 in a book written by Mark uh, Ab Masick uh, in, in the year 2004 documented that. And in, in that big year, three men, uh, Greg Miller, who was played by Jack Black, Greg Miller's only lives uh, two uh, uh, counties away from where, where we live. Al Leventon from, from Colorado and Sandy Comito all set out to, to, to break the record of, of, of a big year. And Sandy Comito already held that record, I think, at, at 400 or 745 species. And in the end, he, he did break that, that record again. But it occurred to me then with this movie, and by the way, if you ha didn't see the movie, it was popular for about one week. Uh, when we went to see it, there were only five of us in, in, the, uh, in the movie theater. So when, when you think about, there were three famous actors who portrayed th three bird watchers, then it, I began to think again, uh, could there be other famous people, famous people who are famous for other things, uh, who are interested in bird, bird watching very seriously? So the question is, then who are who were or some, or who are some of these famous people in North America, who are famous for something other than bird watching, or uh, but had foul obsessions? Now, you could go to a list of presidents who have had pet birds. For example, George Washington had a parrot. Uh, Thomas Jefferson had a mockingbird for a pet. Uh, James Madison had a parrot. Uh, Andrew Jackson, a parrot. John Tyler, a canary. James Buchanan, a, a bald eagle. William McKinley, a parrot. Dwight Eisenhower, a parakeet. John Kennedy, a, can a canary. Uh, Abraham Lincoln had a turkey and Calvin Coolidge had canaries, a thrush, a goose, a mockingbird, and even a trupial, a trupial which is from, from uh, Central America. So if uh, these are just presidents who have had the, these birds as pets, but you can think right away of probably at least one president who was a very serious birder, and that is Teddy Roosevelt. Now, Teddy Roosevelt uh, was the vice president to William McKinley. And uh, in the first year of McKinley's uh, uh, administration, he was shot and killed. And Teddy Roosevelt became the, uh, the president at the age of 42 years, the youngest to take office at that time. So his first annual message to Congress in, in December of two, nine, uh, 1901 was, the forest and water problems were the most important issues facing the U.S. And uh, I think that's still one of our problems. Well, let's go back to when he was a young fellow. At nine years old, he started his own natural history museum by collecting birds, eggs, and nests, which of course we can't do anymore. At the age of 13, he took lessons in taxidermy. And a year later, his family uh, took a second, or took a trip to uh, abroad including Egypt, and he collected birds on that trip. 
and actually it was well over 600 species of birds and he donated many of those to the Smithsonian uh, Institution in Washington. Now, when he entered Harvard in uh, 1876, he intended to become a, a man of science, much like uh, Audubon, Alexander Wilson. Alexander Wilson is the father of American ornithology, or Spencer Fullerton Baird, uh, who was the assistant secretary at the Smithsonian at that time. However, by, by his senior year, he, uh, he decided not to pursue a career as a scientist, uh, because he fell in love with Alice Hathaway Lee, and he knew that he could not support a family on being an, uh, studying ornithology, so he went into business and law. How, however, in, in, during the, his late teenage years, he uh, uh, spent three summers in the Adirondack Mountains in New York, studying the birds there and documenting them. And he published his first paper, which was a description of all those birds, 97 species uh, that he had found in the Adirondacks. In this, uh, later on, uh, he published his second publication uh, by documenting a list of birds that are found around his home in Oyster Bay. And while he was in the White House, he published a list of birds that were seen in the White House grounds and about Washington. So he's a very, he's a very serious birder and outdoors man, as everybody knows. Now, the uh, biographer D Douglas Brinkley uh, wrote uh, the bi biography of, uh, of Teddy Roosevelt called The Wilderness Warrior. And he, and he said about uh, Roosevelt that he was a profound, he was a pro forest, pro buffalo cougar infatuated socialistic land conserv conservationist who had been trained at Harvard as a Darwinian Huxleyite zoologist and now believed that the moral implications of on the origin of species needed to be embraced by the public. That's uh, Teddy Roosevelt in the center of that picture of people. Now, John Burroughs uh, was a noted naturalist and essayist at that time, and he became a good friend of uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And he had this to say about Teddy in the defense of songbirds. He is a live wire, if, the, if there ever was one, in human form. Now, in the seven years, well, in just under eight years as president, Teddy Roosevelt saved more than 234 million acres of an American wilderness, he created or enlarged uh, 150 national forests, 51 federal land reservations, four national game preserves, six national parks were created, and 18 national monuments. By using the Antiquities Act, Act all he had to do was say, I, do, I so declare it, and he established 18 new bird sanctuaries in, in the US. Now, Teddy Roosevelt had a presidential retreat in Pine Forest, Virginia, and he would go there to, to bird. And in, 19, uh, in 1908, he and John Burroughs went there to, to bird. And uh, they used Frank Chapman's field guide, Handbook of Birds of the Eastern North America. Frank, Champ uh, Frank Chapman was the, no the noted uh, ornithologist at the time. And that, that uh, field guide was written in 1895, and I got a look at that book. There are no photographs, of course, of the birds, or no sketches of the birds. It's just a word description of the birds, and they use that to, to do, do their birding, to identify the birds. But Teddy was so, uh, such a, a, a good ornithologist, he, he said this, or he wrote this to Frank Chapman. He says, when I see you again, I'm going to point out to you one or two minor matters in connection with the song of the Buick's Wren and the looks of the Blue Grosbeak, where we were a little puzzled by your accounts. So he cer certainly wasn't shy. Now he also told Burroughs on that trip that in the previous year, 1907, at, at Pine Knot, that he saw a flock of seven passenger pigeons fly over. Now Martha, the last passenger pigeon, uh, was was in the zoo at uh, 
Cincinnati, and it died in 1914. So uh, Roosevelt's in, uh, uh, observation of 1907 would suggest that maybe he saw the last one of the last flocks, if not the last flock, of uh, passenger pigeons before they became extinct. Now, with with uh, Teddy as uh, as a past president, you might not be recognize this, but uh, this the next pres uh, president who was a very avid birder was uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, he was, uh, of course, president up and uh, for four, four terms. Uh, uh, he was a, the fourth or fifth cousin to, uh, for, to to Teddy Roosevelt. And I have to take a drink here. Teddy Roosevelt was Franklin Roosevelt Roosevelt's role model and hero, and he had a taste for taxidermy as a boy. He collected birds, eggs, and nests as Teddy did, uh, and they're still in his family estate. At about 10 years old, his grandfather gave him a life membership to the American Museum of Natural History, and it took him uh, to meet the great ornithologist, Frank Chapman, the one we just mentioned earlier with, with Teddy Roosevelt, just that he was a little older then. At 11 years old, he asked his parents for a gun so he could be begin collecting birds in his that are native to the county in which he lived, Dutchess County. And by the time he entered college, he had collected and identified about 300 different species of birds. And that remains the most comprehensive collection ever made in, in Dutchess County. Now as president, uh, he, he, he was still uh, birding and he, and he was not popular, this uh, ha ha uh, hobby was not popular with the Secret Service who were, were, who were his entourage. And in fact, in, in uh, 1942, he participated in a, in a Christmas bird count uh, of Dutchess County uh, with another, with a noted ornithologist, Lolo Griscom. And uh, he started out at four o'clock in the morning and now you can understand why his entourage wasn't too happy about that. He started out at four o'clock, birded until eight o'clock, signed the, the checklist and headed back to his estate where the crown prince and princess of Norway uh, were, were, were guests. This might've been the last uh, time that he, he really birded. Now I'd like to draw your attention to, the time, to uh, some previous years in which he was assistant secretary of the Navy. This is in 1913 to 1920. And you'll notice that those, those years uh, included the years of the First World War. And, and during the First World War, what saw the advent of mine warfare. These are these things that were plied in the, in the shipping lanes uh, in, uh, to de detonate when ships came close or bumped into these mines. These look right now like a little bit of like coronavirus. Uh, so, to to uh, to uh, excuse me uh, to uh, attack these uh, these mines, uh, a new class of ships re uh, had to be developed, and these were called mine sweepers. Uh, and and uh, and these ships would also have to have all new ships had to have a new name source. And the procedures and practices uh, of the Navy was typically that the Secretary of the Navy uh, would, would name those, sh those ships or come up with the name source. Of course, the Secretary of the Navy at that time, during World War I, was pretty busy. So he gave that responsibility to uh, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, to, to come up with the name source. And what he did was the name source was that of birds. And so the names of the ships became the USS and the bird name. And the, the first uh, ship that was named uh, was uh, for a lapwing. And so this became the bird class of ships or the lapwing class of ships uh, and, uh, and designated as the mine sweepers. 
Here's an example of the USS Lapwing, and the hull uh, is made of, of wood. Now, uh, in December of uh, 7th, 1941, when Pearl Harbor was, was bombed, uh, here were some of the ships that were in the Pearl Harbor. These were minesweepers, the Turkey, the Bobolink, the Rail, the Turn, the Grebe, and the Vireo. These are all USS ships. Minesweepers, the Cockatoo, Crossbill, Condor, and Reedbird. Reedbird is the uh, Bobolink. And the submarine rescue ship, the Widgeon. So the Widgeon is shown here and the, the, the bird itself as well. In 1937, uh, Franklin Roosevelt designated Aransas National Wildlife Refuge as a refuge for the whooping crane. Uh, there were only 15 of them uh, that were still uh, migrating there. And so they needed a place to, to, to uh, as, as a refuge. So in 1941, it was, the, uh, there were only, I probably said that probably 15 uh, of the birds. And now it's a globally important bird area. Now the next president, I'm sure you're, you're aware of because he received uh, some, some notoriety in the, in the years in which he took up bird watching. He was president up, in, up to 81, but when he left the presidency, he established the Carter Center. It's a non-governmental, non-for-profit organ, organization founded in 1982 that works to advance human rights and alleviate human suffering. Now, the, being uh, uh, the Carter Center he, and representing the Carter Center, he traveled a lot to these countries that were destitute, and he made a number of trips to Africa. And when he took his family there uh, once, he said, could we go out and see some birds? So they arranged for a an expert in birds in, uh, in Tanzania to take him out birding. And by the end of that birding trip, he had 130 bird species to his life list. And by doing this to, uh, in other countries, by the year 2004, he, he had a life list of 1,100 species. He got interested enough such that when he came back to, to Plains, Georgia, he joined the Breeding Bird Survey route. Uh, and then in 2004, this was a write-up, I think, in the Bird Watchers Digest, he took his first spe specific bird trip to the lower Rio Grande Valley. Uh, and he had 100, got 151 species and 57 of those were, were lifers. And I think when, when I went there for the first time, I had a very similar list. Now, uh, it, it's been said that Carter ha had a good ear for the common species found around Plains, Georgia. But another person said that he is a less than mediocre birder. And that would be the case starting at such a late time in, in your life. Uh, so we won't hold that against him. Uh, Carter uh, signed into law the Alaska Lands Act, adding about 104 million acres uh, to the U.S. Uh, national parks, wilderness, and the national wildlife refuge systems. His favorite birds were ones from Africa. The African hoopoe was one of his favorite birds that he had on, that he uh, of the 1,400 or so on his life list. The superb starling is another one, and that bird is in real life very superb. And the third bird is uh, the Arnold's barbet. I haven't seen that bird, but I have seen a number of barbets in Africa. So that covered a few, a couple of the presidents. Uh, how about presidents uh, that tr or men who tried to become president? Uh, John McCain, uh, as you recall, in 2008, made a presidential run with Sarah Palin as, as his uh, running mate. Um, he has property in uh, Sedona, Arizona, and he he said that he's an avid bird watcher. In fact, uh, it's been said that he drags his guests for long walks to indulge his passion for bird watching. Now, back in 2008, during the conventions, now John McCain and uh, Sarah Palin had already gone through their uh, convention process and they were going to be the candidates. Now the Democrats were uh, having their convention 
in Denver, Colorado. And there were protesters outside that convention center. Now these were protesters not against uh, Obama, who was the, the, the candidate they were going, eventually going to nominate. Uh, but they were uh, protesting against John McCain. They were saying they had holding signs and, and marching outside the convention center saying McCain is an admitted, uh, admitted bird watcher. Bird watchers are voyeurs, and bird watching is bird porn. Now, Lindsey Graham, uh, as we, we, we know him, he's still in, in Congress, has said this about John McCain. He says, if you took all the people at, at Gitmo, and Gitmo is, is a Guantanamo, Guantanamo Bay, put them in a cabin for a weekend and make them listen to John talk about birds, they would all spill their guts. So it's pretty clear that McCain was a, a, a serious uh, bird watcher. Now I couldn't come up with his favorite bird, but I assume it was the uh, it might be the Greater Roadrunner since that's a, a, a very common bird in uh, in Arizona. No, I'm not going. To. Okay, the next. Uh, uh, person is, uh, for those of you who are older, would recognize the name, Alger Hiss. Alger Hiss was an American lawyer, a government official, a, a author, a lecturer, and he helped establish the, the UN. Uh, but he was accused of being a communist, a spy, while he was in, employed as a, in the federal government, and eventually became convicted of perjury in connection with, uh, with uh, the with, with the charges that were brought up against him by the House Un-American Activity Committee. Now the House Un-American Activity Committee was an investigative committee of the U.S. House of Rep Representatives created in 1938 to investigate alleged dis disloyalty and subversive activities on the part of private citizens, public employees, and organizations suspected of having communist ties. Those of you who think back in the history of that time, there were a lot of noted people who were accused of being communists. Now, Whitaker Chambers uh, was a senior editor of Time Magazine, and he had been an admitted Communist Party member. And he was called uh, he was uh, called before the House on American Activities Committee, uh, subpoenaed to, to testify to that to that uh, uh, charge. And during that time, the committee asked him, are there any other people you know that were members of the Communist Party during this period of time? And he said, well, Alger Hiss, who was employed by the federal government at the time, uh, was one of those people. So of course they subpoenaed Alger Hiss. And Alger Hiss, during the tes testifying, the committee said to him, said, asked him, do you know Whitaker Chambers? And he says, no, I don't know him. I don't know anything about him. And uh, the committee says, well, Whitaker Chambers says that you, the two of you know each other. And he said, uh, no, that is not true. So this went back and forth. Uh, Chambers would testify and then uh, Alger Hiss would come back in and he would testify. And so to come to some, uh, answer to this, a member of the committee said to, Al, to uh, Whitaker Chambers, does Alger Hiss have any hobbies that you would be aware of or any other thing that you'd be aware of that would not be normally known to the general public, that would not have been published? And Whitaker Chambers says, well, yes, uh, Alger Hiss was a bird watcher, a, a field ornithologist. And he said they used to get up early in the morning and go down to uh, Glen Echo, go out in the canal and observe birds. And he once called me after one of those trips, that is uh, Alger Hiss called Whitaker Chambers and, and was so excited to, to have seen a prothonotary warbler. So after uh, Alger Hiss was then called back in to, to testify and during the, the questions, Richard Nixon, who was a member of that 
House on American Activities Committee, ask uh, Hiss, uh, Mr. Hiss, do you have any hobbies? And, and Alger Hiss kind of fell into a trap here because one of the other members of the committee said, have you ever seen, well, well, Alger Hiss said, well, yes, I'm a bird watcher. Uh, and my wife and I uh, both, both do this. And another member of the committee said, have you ever seen a prothonotary warbler? And Alger Hiss says, well, yes, I have. Uh, it's down on the Potomac. Have you, have you, do you know where I'm talking about? So having talked about seeing the prothonotary warbler and Whitaker Chambers having that knowledge that he did see one ended up being information that was used to convict Alger Hiss of perjury uh, for, for saying he, he did not know Whitaker Chambers. And that's the prothonotary warbler. <clears throat> now there's a person you might not recognize the name, uh, Hank Paulson. He was president and CEO of Goldman Sachs. He was US treasury secretary, a very avid nature lover uh, and so on and so forth. He was members of a number of conservancy boards including the Nature Conservancy. And Paulson, uh, while he was C uh, CEO uh, and of Goldman Sachs was when we had the financial crisis. And Time Magazine named Paulson as a runner-up for the 2008 Person of the Year, saying with reference to the global financial crisis, if there is a face to this financial deb deb debacle, it is now his. Uh, given the, uh, that the realities he faced, there was no obvious better path that he could have followed. And another, uh, documentary film called The Inside Job, Paulson is cited as one of the th persons responsible for the economic meltdown of 2008. And it was in the top 25 list for people to blame for the financial crisis. I point out a couple birds uh, since he had the Bob uh, was involved in the Bobolink Foundation and he was also involved in, in uh, the recovery of the of the St. Lucia parrot, uh, which was becoming uh, extinct. Now, another person is Henry Ford. He, of course, he's the auto manufacturer. And he, at, an age, at age four, he found a nest with eggs. It's very similar stories, and developed an interest in birding. And he fo followed that birding throughout his life. Uh, he, and when he started making money in his uh, automobile uh, company, uh, he, Put, poured money into uh, sanctuaries for birds. Uh, he helped uh, create the, the, the bir uh, bird islands in, the, in the Lake St. Clair. Uh, he poured money into, and, was, and was instrumental in the McLean Bird Bill in, uh, two, in 1909 to 13, and also involved with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and helping to get those, those acts uh, uh, established. He also had an, an interesting theory as to why passenger pigeons became extinct. He felt because of, of all, everybody shooting them uh, for whatever reason, because of their, some were shot for food, that these birds decided to fly west. They flew west out over the Pacific Ocean and they perished. I don't think there's much to that, but that is documented in some writing. Now another person is uh, John DuPont. DuPont was the heir to the DuPont family fortune. He, he's a philanthropist, uh, of course, with that much money. Uh, his worth at that time was about $200 million. And he, uh, he got his BS in zoology at the University of Miami. He went on to get his PhD at Villanova University. And, and he was studying birds and he helped establish the Delaware Museum of Natural History. And representing that uh, museum, he traveled to the South Pacific Islands of the Philippines to uh, study birds, to document birds. And he actually discovered two dozen species of uh, birds that had not been documented before. Now he, 
considered himself a self-styled wrestling coach, and he was very disappointed that the U.S. was not winning as many uh, wrestling matches in the Olympics that, that they should. So he established a uh, Olympic re wrestling complex on his estate called Fox Catcher, and he hired uh, as his one of his uh, coaches, his main coach, uh, eventually uh, David uh, Dave Schultz who was a 1984 Olympic gold medal wrestler, and he became the trainer. Uh, but one, one day, uh, Dave Schultz came driving up to the wrestling complex. John DuPont was standing there, pulled out a gun, and shot Dave Schultz and, and killed him. The, ring, uh, the reason I bring up some of this detail is uh, eventually, DuPont was sent to the State Correctional Institute in our Laurel Highlands of Somerset County, uh, Pennsylvania. I'm from Somerset County. This was called the Somerset State Hospital when, when I was a kid. Not only that, my Uncle Charlie happened to be the, the head of housekeeping uh, at, at that institution as well. If you want to learn more about John DuPont or that, that story, See, you can check out the uh, film called Foxcatcher. Now, another person uh, that uh, you might be aware of is Jane Alexander. Uh, she's an actress. She's won a number of awards for the, her, her role in the Great White Hope, Kramer versus Kramer, All the President's Men, and Eleanor and Franklin. She is said to, uh, she has said that she was interested in birds from, a, from a, their childhood. And as she grew up, she just became more and more interested. She got involved in Christmas bird counts, the great backyard bird count. She had breeding bird surveys uh, as well that she participated in. She's on the board of the National Audubon Society right now and has been for a number of years. She said, uh, her, her favorite bird, she says, is the wood thrush. And I'll see if I can get this wood thrush to sing. She said that it was what she considered the most beautiful song of a, of a, of a bird. Now, the next person I want to talk about is Ben Crenshaw, the golfer. He's won a number of uh, PGA tours. It says his hobbies are golf, golf course architecture, golf history, bird watching, and fishing. He got interested in, in, in birding at a very young age when his older brother shot a uh, robin was a BB gun, and uh, Ben was so upset about it, he collected a robin, put it in a shoebox, and buried it, buried it in his backyard, and he's been interested in birds ever since. Now, Crenshaw likes certain bird courses be better than others because of the birds that are on those, those uh, golf courses. For example, uh, sawgrass near Jacksonville, Florida, is a good spot for, for viewing ospreys. And he likes Quail Hollow in Charlotte, North Carolina for its Eastern Bluebirds and Silver, Silverado in California for its acorn woodpeckers. Now, when he's been out birding with partners on, on these golf courses during tournaments, uh, he tried to, he's tried to convince his partners to also be interested in birds. And while he was birding with Fuzzy Zoller, he said he wasn't very interested in the black chin hummingbird or the Wilson snipe that were on the sixth hole when they, when they were playing at La Casa. Now, when he was in Italy at a tournament, uh, he was quoted as saying, I wish I were back home in Texas. Uh, I'm from the hill country and the, the golden cheek warblers will be migrating, migrating through right now and I didn't want to miss that. And so I consider three of his, his uh, favorite birds are the Wilson snipe, which was on the golf course, the black chin hummingbird, and of course, then the golden cheek warbler from the, the hill country of, uh, of Texas. Now this is just a, 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 a gimme here. Uh, Rory, uh, Rory McElroy, who's a current uh, golfer, not a really a birder, but he does watch this uh, ring neck pheasant across the green while he was golfing. The next person is Jim Watson. Jim Watson, uh, along with 
uh, Francis Crick and, uh, and another scientist won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for physiology and medicine for elucidating the DNA structure. This is the, the double helix structure. Uh, he got interested in birds at a very early age because his father was a, a, a birder and his family believed in books, birds, and the Democratic Party. They were from Chicago. Now, he stopped going to su uh, Sunday, Sunday Mass so he could go out with his, his dad for Monday morning walks in Jackson Park. And it's, it's there where he learned to take copious notes of, of everything that he, that he saw. He has the date. He has the two participants, his father and himself, where they were in Jackson Park, the temperature, and the list of birds. And he said he, he, he learned early on to keep very careful notes on birds. Uh, as a life scout, he used to take uh, hikes. A life scout is the second highest uh, uh, award in uh, scouting. Uh, and he, he would fall behind because he was watching the birds. Uh, and, and at 14 years old, he participated in the Quiz Kid uh, radio program, and he took his winnings uh, and to buy a, a pair of uh, Bosch, Bosch and Lone binoculars. Now, I started college at the University of Chicago in, uh, when he was 15 years old. Uh, his interest in birds drew him toward a career in biology, uh, and so uh, because he said, I wanted to become a professional ornithologist. And he said he remained all through his college career a fervent ornithologist, especially during the spring and fall migration. He even took an advanced ornithology course in, at the University of Michigan. You can see him in the back row, second from the left. He, he got his PhD from the Indiana University and when he matriculated there, they said, you cannot major in ornithology. We don't have a, a major in that. So he decided to major in zoology. And then during that time, he, he did uh, assist in a, in a bird course that was being offered. And uh, he, all, he also gave his formal lecture to, his, to the zoology faculty on Darwin's finches. So he really intended to be an ornithologist. Uh, but in that, in that last year or so, he was given a book by Ed, Edwin Schrodinger, which was called, What is Life? And, uh, and it talked about the role of the gene. And, and the essence of life is in the f information carried in our genes. And this led him away from ornithology and, in, and, and, and into uh, microbiology. And for that, he and Francis Crick, along with uh, Maurice Wilkins, won the Nobel Prize in 1962. That was only took, he published, they published that original paper it was not only less than a thousand words, and, and nine years later, he got the no, they got a Nobel Prize for that. I've indicated a special sp this species that he liked because he can never find it in Chicago. He had to go to Southern Illinois or Indiana to see the pileated or pileated woodpecker. And the last person I'm gonna talk about is Anton Dvorak. He's a Czech music composer, but he did spend a few years in the U.S., this is uh, his his home. An overview of his home uh, in a little village just north of Prague in in, in uh, the Czech Republic. Uh, he planted trees and uh, to, to attract the birds, and he had blackbirds, thrushes, and many other birds that come to that. But his favorite, of course, was the pigeon. And in fact, he had, he wrote a musical piece called. The wild dove, uh, to because he liked these uh, uh, the pigeons so much. So, in, in the fall of eighteen ninety two, uh, Dvorak uh, uh, was invited to come to New York City to be the director at the National Conservator Conservancy Conservatory of Music. His uh, work was to teach American musicians and composers and to write music and direct concerts. And his wife came along with him and a couple of their children, a few remained back in, in the Czech Republic. And so he would spend his, su his Sundays in, 
in uh, Central Park watching the birds. He, of course, enjoyed the hummingbirds because there's no hummingbirds in, in, in Europe. And, and, he, and, and many other of the birds that were seen in, in uh, Central Park. But after one year, he got homesick and he wanted to return to the Czech Republic. And uh, it turns out that his assistant with the, the uh, conservant Conservancy uh, was it also a Czech American. And he said, why don't you invite the rest of, the rest of your family over to, uh, to the US and spend the summer in a little town called Spillville, Iowa. And that's located on the Turkey River. So he did that. And uh, this is an overview of, uh, of Spillville. I checked back on the population. The population has been around 400 people forever. But, but uh, back then, almost all the people who lived there were of Czech descent. So he would feel at home. Uh, and this was a, a considered a place rich in the sights and sounds of water, gentle winds, and especially bird song. Well, after being there for a few days, he saw for the first time a scarlet tanager and he heard it singing. And that, that's, that uh, song, he then put into the third movement, as the theme of the third movement of the American Quartet, the string quartet. So this is the bird, the scarlet tanager, and I'll play its song first. And, th and this is what he made into it. So after all that, this, this has been my tale of man, nature, and foul obsession. Thanks for uh, putting up with me. Oh, how do I do that? Yeah, yeah. That was, that was wonderful. That was way more than putting up with you. I thoroughly enjoyed the history le lesson. If anybody has any questions, um, we have additional uh, appreciation in the chat for the great program. Uh, again, if you are joining via Zoom and you want to use your mic to discuss or ask any questions, please feel, feel free. Um, you can also put your questions in the chat should you have any or you want to add to our group knowledge of famous birders. Very interesting. Thank you. I'm going to ask when um, Teddy Roosevelt collected all the birds, did he collect them dead like Audubon or were they alive? Oh, no, they were dead. He would, they would shoot them. And that's why he had, uh, had to have experience uh, training in, in uh, taxidermy because uh, you, you just couldn't keep them with the meat. It would spoil. So they, he would skin them and fill them with uh, cotton, I assume. The skins, yeah. While we wait to see if there are any other questions or comments, what I'm gonna do is go ahead and put in a plug as I tend to do for next month's presentation as well. And I will, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna paste the link should you want to go ahead and register for next month's presentation via Zoom. So if you follow the link that I just put in the chat, we will host John Dillon. So I think a lot of people, if not everybody joining us, probably knows that John Dillon is our current president of Louisiana Ornithological Society. And he is also a member of the Louisiana Bird Records Committee for 10 years. And so that presentation is gonna be specifically about how to document rare, uh, rare birds. He will walk us through the often uncertain and confusing aspects of reporting rare bird species, something that 
Dr. Chaucer probably knows a little bit about as well, having been on the committee in Ohio. And then John Dillon will also answer questions about the purpose, requirements, cautions, and benefits of these rare bird documentation and reports. So um, I have also created the Facebook event for that. And then I will email our Baton Rouge Audubon Society list serve. So if you don't follow the link now, you'll receive the email for that as long as you're on our listserv. Well, Dwight, thank you so very much again. I, I Again, I just really enjoyed that. I got a kick out of a lot of it and the history lesson was wonderful. It's great to see who else in the the world of famous people are birders, like everybody else who's probably on the call. Okay, well, you're welcome. Marie, thank you for putting us in touch with your friend. Okay.